Welcome to the Commonwealth Club and the Michelle Miao Show, coming to you from the Toby Family Auditorium at our very empty headquarters building in San Francisco. The Commonwealth Club is doing all of its programs digitally, online, and free. Today, Michelle Miao and I are here in the studio, along with a very socially distanced audio and video staff, and our special guest is joining us via video conferencing technology from nearby Berkeley, California. You can see our upcoming online programs, including one today at 2 p.m., when I would get to recommendations from three TV critics about what to watch while you're stuck at home. Um, you can find all that at commonwealthclub.org slash online. On our website, you can also find ways to support the club during these uncertain times. And now, I'd like to introduce Michelle Miao. <laughs> Uh, good, it's good to see you, John. Uh, you know, you. despite you know, uh, everything that we're going through, and it definitely just feels nice. I forgot how much um, I really do enjoy human beings. <laughs> 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 if you're joining us for the first time, the Michelle and Meow Show is your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. And I'm super excited for our guests. Let me quickly introduce him. His name is Andy Warner. He's a comics artist and author of Spring Rain, This Land is My Land, and the New York Times bestselling Brief Histories of Everyday Objects. He's a contributing editor at The Nib. He's an instructor at the Animation Workshop in Denmark and at Stanford University. You can follow him on Twitter at Andy Comics. So, Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Great Shall I start? Here. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. can I throw up? The yeah, I mentioned I, so. uh, I mentioned uh, Denmark and you recently were in Denmark. And can you tell us what happened? Because I think that all ties into the fact that you're in you're in Berkeley right now and we're all socially distanced. Um, yeah, that was uh, I've been through two country shutdowns, actually, because <laughs> uh, I was teaching in Denmark uh, this two week course that I teach every other year. Um, called Applied Comics. It's a really great unit um, at this amazing comic school where they basically work with clients um, that are NGOs mm -hmm. and do like a, you know, fake corporate client project doing comics. So, it, you know, it's teaching cartoonists how to survive in the real world. It's amazing. Um, then, you know, the Italian situation was getting worse and worse and everybody was getting more and more afraid in Europe. And then suddenly in the middle of the second week of my two week unit, um, everything shut down in Denmark basically overnight. Um, the bars all closed, the restaurants closed, gatherings more than, you know, 50 people, sort of the standard thing. But this was one of the um, first ones that was spreading um, outside of, you know, the hot spots like in Italy and China. Um, and um, so the one by one, the felt my fellow professors were kind of flown out back to their home countries because the animation workshop um, uses foreign professors. That's how they Sort of staff themselves. Um, and I was the last one in the dorms. It was very weird. Um, then they flew me out at 3 a.m. on Thursday. Um, and immediately after that, the, like, the dorms were turned into a quarantine. Um, going through the airports was crazy. This was the only thing that they did to um, test me. They asked me where I'd been, obviously. Um, you know, had I been to Italy or China was basically the question. This is before really anybody was taking into account the fact that the income, you know, this virus spreads before um, right. people really start displaying symptoms. Um, and so I didn't touch anything, washed my hands a ton, flew on very weirdly empty planes, um, got in kind of two days before the big travel ban started. Um, and then the day I touched down, um, the stay-at-home order was ordered for California. So that was my second um, wow. shutdown. I flew from sort of one shutdown, and while I was in the air for that day, it was spreading um, under me. Um, and then I stayed inside um, for uh, two weeks, basically. I mean, I, I live on a compound with another house and twins, and my sister-in-law lives here and two friends in the other house, and we all sort of have a large biome that is inevitable when you have two and a half year old twins and a dog. Um, so it's not been as lonely as other people um, probably, but uh, basically ever since I landed and got home, uh, I stayed home until I made sure I wasn't infectious. Oh. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, that's a common story. Like I talked a friend through 
he was in Toronto and his family was in Regina and he was like, do I fly home to them right now or do I wait it out in Toronto? And wow. it's a tough question. I think a lot of people had to face. Yeah. I'd be interested to see, you know, the next graphic memoir by Andy Warren, <laughs> uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic, but we'll, we'll start talking about your most recent memoir, Spring Rain. It's a graphic memoir of love, madness, and revolutions, which could apply to, you know, many things today. But the, the, the graphic memoir that I've thoroughly enjoyed, I was just saying it before the program started, um, I spent more time absorbing, you know, the images. You're a com comics artist, and, uh, you know, that really was a different way of placing myself through these stories that you're telling in your memoir. It starts out, you're a college student studying abroad, uh, head to Beirut, and, and that shortly after George W. Bush um, was elected, or re-elected, right? And, yeah, right and, before, actually. It yeah. Was and so I think it's an appropriate thing to start there because it, it kind of is like, you know, it's a new time, it feels positive, and then things quickly spiral into something else. You could talk to yeah. us about that. Yeah. I mean, so I think that that um, 2005 uh, was really an interesting time um, in the Middle East because uh, you had this state that had been, you know, really important part of the fabric of the region um, invaded and kind of uh, ripped apart by uh, the global hegemon. Um, and 2005 was really right before um, that had, you know, things had really started to ripple out by that point. Um, like from the get-go, everybody knew this was going to be a disaster. But, um, you know, you had the images from Abu Ghraib starting to circulate. Um, you had uh, the insurgency really starting to pick up steam. You know, it wasn't 2006 where Iraq totally descends into civil war um, yet, but it, violence was really starting to spread. Um, and, you know, the being an American, um, I think abroad anywhere is an interesting experience because there's always this aspect to it that um, uh, because you are kind of the face of the hegemon of the empire, like everybody in the places that you're going to has a relationship with the place that you're from um, that you may not share, you know, going back because Americans are sort of famously close-minded and pay only attention to their own borders. Um, but especially in the Middle East, um, America's relationship with that region is just so long and bitterly entwined, um, you know, going back to um, the discovery of oil in Saudi Arabia, basically. I mean, even before that, but that's really where um, this kind of embrace started. Um, you know, we've toppled regimes, we've invaded places. And so um, I think it's never not a weird time to be an American in the Middle East, and rightly so. Um, but 2005 was sort of the beginning of this very unstable era. I mean, 2003 really was with the um, Iraq war, but uh, you could start to see it really starting to curdle by 2005. Take us, in order to get into this, tell us how you ended up, I mean, of all the places you wanted to go, you went to Beirut. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, when you're young, your life is kind of this weird series of accidents. Uh, you end up in these places. Like I um, went to college and knew that I wanted to study some sort of literature. Um, and maybe it would be English, maybe it would be comparative literature. I spoke French. Um, and then I, um, my brother's recommendation took this class on um, uh, Abbasid Caliphate era Arabic poetry. And it was really, really beautiful and kind of blew my mind. Um, it was my freshman year. And then from there, I started taking, this is at Cornell, I started taking more and more classes in their Eastern Studies Department, history classes, literature classes, um, and um, got interested in Lebanon. Um, Lebanon, you know, had this 15 year civil war um, that really had um, torn the fabric of the society apart. And then there had been a peace process that was sort of unfinished. Um, Israel had 
occupied Lebanese land for 10 years after the Civil War. Syria, at the point that I was interested in it, was still occupying Lebanese land. Um, I mean, it's this interesting country. It's incredibly diverse. It has this really strong literary tradition. Um, and Beirut seemed interesting, so I went there. <laughs> I was, you know, 21. <laughs> 21, and um, I think, you know, well, John, we both remember the, that moment, 21, and being... Uh, uh, adventurous and, and wanting to learn and also at the same time starting to understand at least uh, politics not just in the classroom but in your own experiences and so it, it, it kind of described to us one of the questions that came up for me which was when things started to get really bad suicide bombings, um, some violence and mass protests, uh, that, that didn't, that didn't dissuade you in continuing on with, you know, your education and staying in Beirut. And at what point, you know, did you really say to yourself, like, I'm going to see this through, I want to continue being here, um, and did you ever feel like, you know, I want to go back, I want to, I, I should leave, I should go back home? Um, no, I never really felt like I should go back home. So to, I mean, it was from, Beirut is a really interesting place, um, Lebanon in general is, but Beirut as a city is in particular because, um, because of its history, because of the history of the Lebanese Civil War. So many Lebanese themselves grew up abroad, came back um, or were like raised abroad because of the war and came back or were in the war and you know every three months or so kind of like this like you'd have to not leave your house for a little while but way more dangerous um, and so when the war ended and everybody came back everybody came back from all these different places so it's this hyper multicultural um, place and there's always been a lot of foreigners that were there too um, before the war not really during the war but foreign press bureaus have always been based there. Um, and then, especially after the war. And those, um, everybody's kind of woven together. Um, and, you know, in a lot of other places, there's like a local community and a foreigner community, and they're like very, very separate. Um, and because everybody's speaking three different languages in Lebanon, um, it's just kind of, more mixed together than many other cities that I've been and lived in. And I've been and lived in many, many cities. I grew up all over the place in my childhood and I traveled a lot in my youth and stuff like that. Um, and so when these events started happening, um, I think my reaction was probably also based on the reaction of a lot of the Lebanese people around me, which is this resiliency in the face of um, being subjected to political violence and um, controlled by a like brutal um, elite for you know a really long time. Um, and so it's not that people aren't like surprised that like the assassination of Rafi Kariri was this huge shocking event and then the withdrawal of the Syrian troops after these enormous protests and the following bombings that have still never been resolved in the string of assassinations, like all of these are shaking events, shaking events and like people get scared and stuff like that. But um, it's, uh, it's a very strong place. I mean, even now they had this uh, really, really long street protest that brought down the government. Um, a new government came in, like it was um, really going places, um, even though the new government is entirely complicit in the old power structures, but then the outbreak happened, everybody's at home, so that's on hold. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's a, like, there's a bombing and then people go out to the clubs, like it's, it's sort of the, the way things are there. Um, and that's not to say that it's um, unique in that, you know, there are a lot of places like that. And I think if it happened here, we would eventually adapt to that too. Like there was a time in the 1960s when there was a bombing every single day in America um, and people did their thing. One really nice thing about this book is it really showing that that life and the vibrancy of the life that you guys were, were experiencing there. Whereas obviously, again, talking about Americans with blinders, 
I think generally the assumption of, of you know so much of the Middle East is that it's extremely conservative and you know and, and you even have a story in there uh, where one of the people you you meet is talking about um, how he'd been in Iran for a short time and and could you explain what he talks about how <laughs> kind of the, the the nightlife that he finds there and, and I think people would yeah yeah these huge raves um, that were like out in the in the rural uh, you know behind. Uh, like way, way out in the wilderness, which is, you know, stuff that I actually remember from growing up in California that was similar. Um, like the the thing that was an interesting thing about, I guess, being abroad starting when I did was I, you know, I'm from this generation that came of age with the internet. Like when I was a kid, we didn't have the internet and we got it when I was a kid. Um, back then we got computers and the computers got better and we had AOL and stuff like that. And these connections and subcultures and ideas spread everywhere. Um, like I have friends, um, you know, who like grew up playing D and D in Beirut and stuff like that. Like the, um, and so like hipster cultures, um, drug subcultures, uh, queer subcultures, um, like, these networks exist everywhere. And in the age of the internet, everybody was like learning from them and, you know, doing these things. And it kind of blew my mind that this guy was talking about a rave in Iran that, you know, if you probably has the same music and the same lights and it's just a different language that the people are speaking, same drugs too. Speaking of coming of age, um, you definitely were very open in your own uh, journey and adventure and, and finding yourself and, and sexuality um, and in a different place. You know, I think a lot of times people look at like exploring your sexuality like it, it's uh, more open, you know, to in the West or in America or in, in a different country. But um, where you are at it, you're most of your social circle are very open people. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think Beirut is a um, is not a unique place for that in the Arab world, for sure. But it's you know it's a city that has like a very strong um, queer community that is really connected and cares about each other, um, and is um, like it, it's a liberal city. It's um, uh, like very, like I said, very cosmopolitan, very cosmopolitan. Um, it's not particularly culturally conservative. Like there's parts of the, there's a lot of parts of Lebanon that are culturally conservative, like the South is, um, but there's a lot of parts of the US that are culturally conservative, <laughs> like, the South, you know? yeah. like the South. Um, and I think that's more true than a lot of people realize about more parts of the world. Like, um, you know, in, um, like even in places that are more culturally conservative than Lebanon, like in Egypt, there are, um, you know, hipster communities where it's like totally normal to be like pretty out. And um, it's like, I think anywhere where you go in the world, you can, not anywhere, but um, we're a lot more alike and connected than I think we realize from sitting where we are in the U.S., so at the beginning of this book, you had broken up with your girlfriend yeah, and head off to Beirut and you fall in with a, a group of friends who, you know, largely or a, a fair number of them were LGBT of one sort or another. Um, mm -hmm. what, did you gravitate to them? Did they just find you? Was it luck of the draw who you hadn't hung out with? How did that? I think it's both. Honestly, I mean, my, I don't really talk about this in the book, but most of my, a lot of my friends throughout my life have been um, uh, gay men, really. Like my best friend in college, Steve, who I now live with on this compound out here. Uh, my best friend from middle school, who I'm, is still one of my best friends. Um, I've never entirely felt super comfortable with sort of traditional um, cis, like, uh, masculine straightness, like bonding, I guess. I don't really know how to phrase that, but um, like I've always, in most places that I've ended up, um, 
been on the fringes or very involved with queer communities, but like my own sexuality is kind of mostly presents as straight and kind of has been that way in my life um, with exceptions. Um, but yeah, so I don't think it was, um, it wasn't crazy basically, but. Um, this is probably a good time to bring up your father's career. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really disrupted childhood. <laughs> Uh, t talk a bit about that, if you would, both and how it formed you, but also in yeah. particular, what he studied. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what you took. Yeah, away. yeah. So, yeah. My, um, so my dad studies sex changing fish. Um, he uh, studied um, a bunch of different kinds. Um, the two ones that he studied most were sheep's head and blue head wrasse. Um, blue head wrasse sort of shaped my childhood, we would follow his research um, around in different research stations. I grew up in like um, Corsica, Panama, St. Croix, Japan, um, England, um, all over the place. Um, we mostly stopped moving around by the time I was like six or seven um, and would stay um, in the States for nine months out of the year and then spend summers at a research station. Um, so we were gone three months out of the year and back nine months. Um, and uh, his research is really interesting. It's like all of the, um, so I can I can really go into boring detail about all of this if you want me to. Well, Do you want me to? The, I mean, I, I kind of wanted to get to the, I mean, yeah. the actual core of what he's doing and, 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 and researching is something that obviously in today's world where transgender issues are, are yeah, front and center, where that's something that so many people have just, in their core beliefs, that is something that does not change, cannot change. Yeah. And, the fact that your father's been studying this happening in other <laughs> living organisms all, you know, all his career. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a common, it was like a pretty common topic growing up, actually, honestly. Like we, because, you know, I grew up around scientists, like, and there were a lot of other biologists that he knew were, you know, working on the same topic or research um, grad students, stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's super common in fish and amphibians uh, because um, you're just like changing what gametes you shoot, you know? Um, so the, um, like he, the blue head wrasse that he study, um, are all born female, um, and they live on reefs, um, and the largest female in any given group, um, will, any given like territory will, um, transition into a male, um, and then he basically is the only one that can mate with all the other females and they all have their little nests. Um, and then um, if he dies or something, um, the next largest female in this like kind of group um, will then transition into the dominant male on the reef, except there's also these things called sneaker males, which are really interesting that he like figured out how they, why they happen. Um, and they're actually, they're really small females um, that don't get to spawn as much with, um, don't get to mate as much with the, the big male. Um, and the way that fish mate is, you know, they, they go up like that and they shoot sperm and eggs into a cloud. So that's why it's like pretty easy to just swapping out what gametes you're um, shooting and like what your coloration and size is. Um, and so these little females that don't get to mate as often, sometimes they'll transition into a male and they're called sneaker males. And while the dominant male and the female are mating, these sneaker males will run up and shoot a bunch of sperm and then run away <laughs> and hide. And that's, and it's like more, you know, they have more babies doing that than they would if they were just the lowest female in the totem pole. But like clownfish are all born male, for example, because um, they, rather than having a big, one big reef with a bunch of little nests. And so, you know, you have a bunch of females and one big male clownfish live in an anemone um, that's like one nest and so you have all these little males and one big female and the biggest male in the group of little males will transition into the, the female and she lays a bunch of different eggs and then all her little males um, fertilize the eggs. 
Wow. And if she dies, then the biggest <laughs> male transitions. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different like ways that it can happen or ideas why and stuff like that. But it's not uncommon in both amphibians and fish. Yeah. Kind of examples. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your 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 comics, the the art pieces of it and the images, uh, you know, especially during the time that you're going through self-discovery, finding your sexuality, addressing your mental health, experimenting with drugs and, and war-torn, you know, Lebanon. Um, the, the, your process of it, you know, some of the, the images that you were scribbling out, uh, you were addressing your emotions that are going on. Some of it is also what you were seeing, what you were experiencing. What was what was the uh, describe the process for folks who don't have a copy of your book um, or yeah. aren't as lucky as I am because I have it in my hands. <laughs> um, it was kind of hard, actually. I mean, it's about in a certain way, it's a book about um, a mental breakdown and one that's haunted me for the rest of my life um, and, you know, had echoes and in ways that I think about it, I can find roots and things like that. Um, but because that happened at the time, um, I'm not the most reliable narrator kind of um, for the project. Um, but it's interesting because I have uh, a bunch of different sources. So I had a diary that I was keeping. Um, you know, I have my own memories. In the diary that I was keeping, um, that gets weirder, and I start drawing these weird things. And I always draw weird things. I mean, uh, that's my job. <laughs> but, um, the you know my handwriting changes. Um, I start getting like paranoid in it in this kind of distressing way, um, and find these like weird aches and like it just gets like very. Um, and so that's expressed in the diary. Um, I have a blog that I was keeping online to uh, update my parents on whether or not you know, I was doing okay and sort of the continued political situation. Um, and that of course has dates. I stopped dating stuff in my diary after a certain point, but I can cross-reference that with the blog. Um, and then I talked to other people that I knew then. Um, I have a bunch of letters that my brother photocopied and sent me um, that he saved from that time. I have some letters to my then girlfriend, now wife that she remembers, but we lost um yeah i don't know i did a lot i like dug through a lot of sourcing and i made a big like excel spreadsheet actually trying to figure out what happened on what day um and then tried to get it as right as i could um and some people asked me to change their names too so i changed people's names and how they look and where they were from and stuff like that. you mentioned but, that Sorry, what? I was just, you, you mentioned kind of like, okay, because of what you're going through, you may not be the most reliable uh, uh, source on this. How often when you, you know, consulted with uh, your girlfriend, now wife, or your brother, or the, your friends from Beirut to kind of recount some of this stuff, how often did you find that your recollections was just, was wrong, or it was? Um, not that much wrong. Like you'd find these like weird framing differences um like uh a friend would so like this trip that i took to jordan is kind of this key part of the yeah. uh like latter third of the book um because it sets up this crisis um, but i didn't keep any record of it in my diary for some reason and so it's only what i remembered offhand um that i have access to and i didn't write about it in my blog um, and I, I talked to a couple people about it, and it was all similar stuff, but we were sort of, were sort of emphasizing different parts of it. And um, I mean, this is all 14 years later, basically, that you're trying to recreate um, scenes. And uh, I don't know, I try to be pretty upfront about that, actually, in the book, um, with, because it's a book that deals with instability, um, in general, I thought that it was justified to address the fact that I was an unstable narrator and that the source materials themselves were kind of unstable, but I was doing my best, I guess. It's interesting you say, you know, un an unstable narrator when, uh, for me, this is my first graphics memoir that, you know, read from beginning to end. It took me way longer than it would normally take me to read, uh, you know, a memoir written. And, and it was because I was so absorbed 
through the images or what I perceived were what you were seeing or what you had experienced at the time. And one of the things um, that I, that I feel like I got a better grasp of understanding is the complex politics and relationships in the Middle East, you know, between Lebanon and Syria. And there's so much misinformation mm -hmm. if you're always following, you know, social media or uh, Western media and you're, what you think you know what's happening there is, is not really necessarily the truth. And so what I got from your entire memoir, even though you weren't focused on talking about the politics of the Middle East, uh, was that it, you know that that this is this this happened and and this is what happened in my world and um this is how i saw it and it it was it seemed like it was so basic to to understand or not basic but like clear i don't know if like you get those kinds of responses from folks who are now starting to pay attention to the conflict in the middle east who you know or see your memoir and are like, I, I feel something different. I, I understand something different about what's going on there. Well, I mean, uh, a lot of my career actually is based on that. I mean, like I, a lot of my work as a comics journalist um, and work for the NIB um, and then the early foundations of my career working at Slate um, and places like that, uh, I was doing stuff, um, kind of explainer comics work about politics in the Middle East, um, kind of because it was in the wake of 2011, basically. It was a very dramatic, is remains a very dramatic time in the region um, and is a continuation of the very dramatic time that sort of started off in 2003. But, um, the, you know, I had this background, this academic background um, in, uh, history from the region um, and uh, this firsthand political knowledge. Um, one of the aspects of my professional career is kind of explaining things um, in all of my journalism. Um, and so I came to the conclusion that I couldn't tell this story, um, this personal story without also being a political story um, because it is a story about um, Revolutions always kind of being unfinished business and the way that we perceive uprisings and popular movements um, in this kind of faddish, like brief Soren's eye of attention and then, you know, the wheel turns and we lose interest um, is really problematic and uh, kind of destructive. Um, and so I, I really try hard um, in anything I do to explain what I know about it and make it interesting to my readers, mm -hmm. I guess. Now, not, you don't write and draw all of your comics, uh, right? You've done some projects where someone else has done the writing? Um, I've done both, actually. So I've done more writing for other people to draw than drawing that other people have written, but I have done both. Um, my second book, This Land is My Land, uh, yeah. which was about utopias. It was just like a collection of histories. Um, probably good reading in this time, <laughs> um, uh, was drawn by Sophie Louise Dam, who is an amazing Danish illustrator, a former student of mine actually from that school in Denmark. Oh, cool. um, and then uh, about probably a third of my nib work um, is drawn by other people. Um, is that I don't often so much draw other things that people write because writing takes way less time than drawing. And so yeah. I can have a far bigger output if I write as well as write and draw as opposed to draw as well as write and draw. Is, is there a, I don't want to ask it as blunt, as, as simply as do you prefer to, to write and, and draw your own work, but I mean, is there a, a feeling of uh, what, a loss of control when someone else is then going to take your words and turn it out or is that kind of exciting to see what they do with it. No, it's super cool. I've always loved working with other people. Um, it's really fun to, I actually get very little stage direction when I write. I write really sparely. Um, and so there's nothing to really be disappointed about because when I'm working with another cartoonist, it's almost always somebody that I have either edited personally in the past. So I have like a close relationship with, or I've written for before, or like I really know their work. Um, and so I trust them a lot and I want them to make visual decisions that I would never make. Um, and This Land is My Land is like a great example of that because Sophie 
took this idea that I had of just like cataloging and you know creating like an organizational matrix for people's weird utopian projects and then telling these little histories about them and gave it like this art style that's super whimsical and amazing that I would never would have thought of. The uh, the, gra- the the memoir Spring Rain it's 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 your it's your story and so it's very personal and also stories of other folks uh, who were in your life. And John mentioned it earlier. It starts off with a breakup, and your heart broken, still miss you know your ex girlfriend throughout uh, being in Beirut. And but you do mention that you come back home and you reconnect with uh, your ex girlfriend, got back together, who's now your wife. I was just curious what that reunion, you know, what, what was it like? What led up to it? How did it happen? Because you have to wait for the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm very curious because I mean, she, she was just such a, I felt like, you know, she just kind of held all these stories together in a lot of ways. Um, some of the, the, the distancing that you were doing with the relationships that you had developed over in, in Beirut with friends and, you know, partners or hookups, um, Kathy was just mm-hmm. kind of always there. And then when mm-hmm. you talked about, you know, oh yeah, we got back together and she became my wife. I was like, wait, yeah. but like, <laughs> did you tell her like all, you know, you had all these experiences how did it happen? Yeah. Um, it took, it took some doing. I mean, we got back together we broke up again. We got back together. We broke up again. We broke up for like three months. We broke up for six months. And then we just realized that everybody else you know we dated other people during those times um and then we kind of realized that uh this i mean we've known each other since we were 18 i think was part of it um and so it's hard to convince yourself that a person that you met that young and started a relationship with when you were 20 is this person that you then end up being with forever, or at least so far. Um, And so it took a lot to get there. And that's really kind of too big of a story uh, for, you know, the book that's about the mental health breakdown. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, she's an amazing person. I mean, she uh, is fascinating and, um, you know, fascinating is like one of the most important things, right? Like to have a person that is really interested in the world in a way that you're interested in the world and you can always talk to and laugh with. Um, And uh, you find this thing that works and it kept working and still does. I mean, she's taking care of our kids and putting them to bed while we're locked under a pandemic so many fucking years later. Um, I don't know, you you never, I think, realize at the time that you've you've got that, that story that ends up being that one um and that's kind of what this book in part was about was um i think part of the maybe what was um a wrecking ball in me then part of it was a separation from something that i didn't realize was so fundamental so quickly let's get into the the breakdown that you suffered there um Mm. and as i'm reading this and and this is progressing you know, in, in you're experiencing this personally, and then you're going out with your friends, et cetera. How much of that do you think was all going to happen to you no matter where you had been at that time in your life, as far as the breakdown? How much of it was Beirut and the what it was going through? How much of it was the drugs? I mean... Yeah, um, I don't... I have no idea. I don't think I'll ever know. And I think that's a question that has haunted me ever since then, and that... Um, was a reason why I wrote this book is that it's uh, um, so I mean you know part of the breakdown part of what scared me in the breakdown was this this family history um, where it was sort of woven into my family and uh, talked about in these tragic terms um, in the way that uh, bipolar disorder affected my my grandmother um, and how that affected their family and then also eventually in sort of a roundabout way um, affected the death of my aunt um, and my mother being the one who found her body was then sort of profoundly affected by that for the rest of her life. Um, And those 
mental illnesses uh, occur at that time in somebody's life. Um, and I had grown up with these stories and I had like done the reading. And so when I started to notice this like weird, unreasonable paranoia developing in myself and stuff like that, I, I think I kind of pathologized it and made it worse. Um, and um, not knowing, I mean, maybe it was that time in my life and this is just one manic incident and I'll never have another. That happens to people, it happens to plenty of people. It also can be triggered by drugs. It can be triggered by personal instability, by stress. Um, never having known why, I think has made it dog me in a way that I've talked to my mom about and she felt similarly about its role in her life. I'm kind of always waiting for another shoe to drop with it. Um, and um, I wouldn't say that I'm entirely out of the clear with that. I mean, I working on this book was a very difficult experience, actually. I mean, comics take a long time. It took two years to make. And so I was sort of living in that self again for two years. And it brought back some bad stuff that um, I didn't necessarily want brought back. And so I went to counseling. I sought out new medication. and seeing what works. I mean, I think that mental health is kind of a lifelong thing. It's not like a problem that you solve um, and figuring out how to be okay with that um, and how to have the people around you be okay with that, I think is an important part of dealing with it. Um, yeah, it's, it's so hard to talk about um, mental health in, in, a, in a lot of ways, especially, you know, when it's about, it's about yourself and uh, could be uncomfortable. Uh, curious to know, since you put out the book and were so open about the, the breakdown and still so honest, even about, you know, after the fact, you're not in the clear, still coping, managing, moving forward. If uh, others have reached out to you to ask questions, to, um, you know, give thanks for putting the book out, putting your story out. Um... I mean, I think that I've definitely had more conversations with people <laughs> about stuff, like even friends actually uh, have talked to me about um, their own stuff that isn't necessarily the same stuff. I do think that maybe writing about um, things that make, um, that are stories that are difficult to tell make other people comfortable telling you their stories. But also, I mean, I think that it's, um, we're in a world where, um, this is a new reality. Like people are talking about these things in general more um, and there's a ton of media out there. And like, I'm part of a enormous community um, and um, you know, a like quiet little voice in that. Um, and you know, there's tons of people from every community speaking about mental health. It's amazing. Um, and um, I think that there's so many more kind of places and people to turn to and stories to read about it and narratives to see. Um, then there were, even when, you know, I was going through this in 2005, which at the time, like I thought was a very progressive time. Um, so I do think that kind of the landscape of how we talk about that in general has changed. Um, and I have benefited from that. I mean, I don't think, um, I probably wouldn't have had it in me to write this book five or six years ago. Like a lot of people were at some, real stories um, and I'm standing on their shoulders. What, what do you want people to get from the book who read it? I mean, who don't know you, who just pick it up and... Um, well, one thing actually was ex something we talked about earlier that um, the world outside of our doorstep is a little more complicated. Um, that, you know, there's places out there that can be critical of America. Um, and have justification for it um, and have their own histories that are very real. Um, and that there's people out there that are probably more likely like you than you'd think. Um, I think that's something I really want people to get out of it um, in the background. And then, I don't know, personally, um, it kind of felt just like a story that I had to do. It was haunting me for a long time. I tried to do it a bunch of times before and just ended up not doing it as well or as honestly as I wanted to. And it was sort of the reason why I started doing comics in the first place. Again, like I'd grown up doing them and then stopped. Um, and so doing that 
was necessary to me. And now that it's done, I don't have to think about it as much um, and, and doing another project. So people can kind of get out of it what they want to get at this point. It's out of my hands. Um, yeah. I don't, you know, identifying as a gender non-conforming queer uh, lesbian. I mean, I mean, you know, we're just so focused here in the in America on uh, the different identities, which is a it's inclusive. Our intention is to be inclusive of of folks. But I feel like you putting out your experience and also um, experiences with other LGBTQ folks from a different country and not having to necessarily call it that, you know, mm -hmm. it just was talking about your relationships and they mattered to you. Um, mm -hmm. that there's this uh, element of uh, other people around the world who may not feel the same as we do here where, you know, these labels are really, really, really important. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know if, like, you know, it's, it's kind of on the same plane as when you describe your continued work in addressing your mental health, but if, like, where you 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 discovered yourself, you found yourself, you know who you yeah. are today, or if that's all always fluid for you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's always pretty fluid for everybody. Um, like with mental health, like life is just this long thing that holds some pretty shocking surprises. <laughs> and I think that anybody that says they're stable in any aspect of their life is fucking kidding themselves. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have sworn, but you know, it's okay. I think we're just on the internet. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like, there's this great, um, yeah, the, uh, like, everything in order tends towards disorder and everything in disorder tends towards order. Uh, so, who knows? Which applies to what yeah. we're actually going through. And that's the thing <laughs> is, like, I, you know, I'm just, we're so super hyper-focused, which, of course, you know, uh, people understand why we're hyper-focused on this pandemic that's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, such a disorder and it's upending people's lives and it's such a huge impact, like, uh, around the world, right? Um, no, it's but wild. the Everybody way, yeah, them. yeah, the way you connect with, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm a stranger, actually, at the end of the day. I've never met yeah. you in person. I'm connecting with you through your book, but... Yeah. Uh, you tell stories about you know, this, uh, we could be going through the most chaotic, disorderly time and, um, you know, what what is part of the resilience in getting over some of the hardest things in life is, uh, you know, connecting with others and learning from others and finding uh, yourself, loving yourself. Uh, so I really appreciate your book during this extremely challenging time, a time that I'd never imagined I'd be experiencing in my own lifetime. Isn't it wild? It's like epoch making. It's really, it, it's, it shakes me in a way that nothing else is kind of shaking me. Um, it's such a, like the, the shared experience of it all is one of the thing that it, things that's totally fascinating. Like my friends in Beirut are under lockdown. Um, my friends in Denmark are under lockdown. Like everybody's under lockdown. It's like this global experience right now. Um, and, um, I think that's something novel. I think that something strange is going to come out of the other side of this. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I think something strange is. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, one thing, one aspect of what you said actually just touched me because, like, you talked about the way that so resilience in societies, and one of the way that the Lebanese build resiliency in um, their, you know in this amazing place in this amazing city is you know not letting the bombings close the bars like going out and stuff like that and having this like amazing super vibrant like um going out culture and arts culture um and it's this is such a ghostly cataclysm because um, that's kind of how we naturally try to build resiliency in the wake of disasters and come together um, is all going out together <laughs> and you can't and the streets are empty. So it's good to talk to you. Mm. Good point. Well, Michelle, of course, is, is a stranger to you. I, of course, have known you for... 14 years or something like that. Uh, yeah, you met me the year after all this. <laughs> yes, uh, our, our viewing audience should know. Uh, Andy was the first person I hired when I came to the Commonwealth Club. He was our designer and art director. 
And one of the things we, we really benefited from was the illustrations you would do for our magazine. And it really gave it character, and, and I've, always, I've always loved that. Um, yeah. I, I th we've got, I think, a few examples of the artwork, and, and I wanted to share them with our, the, our viewers. So, um, so this one is early in the book. Um, tell, us, tell us what was happening here. I mean, this, this kind of gets to where you as the American over there, while everyone else is kind of, I mean, you're always seeing you kind of in a bit as a representative of the United States. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing that's interesting, actually, about being an American abroad is that you always have something to talk to people about, because um, everybody always knows your fucking politics, um, because it sort of governs whether or not they're about to be squashed like a bug. Um, and so, or, you know, and I mean that in like a regional sense, right, because like, we're sort of this like big, unstable, like, buffalo of a country, right, that like, kicks over things and like ruins a region for generations. Um, and so everybody follows our elections. Everybody like knows like when there's a political fight um, cause their media covers it. Um, and so especially being abroad then in the wake of the reelection of George W. Bush which had happened in November, you know three months prior to me going there. Everybody was just like, holy smokes, like how can you guys be so dumb? <laughs> like this guy just like toppled Iraq two years ago. Like we can already see it going wrong. Like how could this happen? And I was a young lefty and everybody I was hanging out in Beirut with were young lefties. Um, so we were just kind of just as flabbergasted as everybody else. So we spent a lot of time bitching about American foreign policy uh, that spring. Just think how it's gonna blow their minds when Donald Trump is reelected. Um, let's go to the next. Uh... next. <laughs> uh, you heard it here first. <laughs> uh, so this was, let's see. Um, yeah, this is a, a smoking hash with my friends um, and a friend of mine, um, Sammy, I call him in the book, um, told me a story about um, why he believes in ghosts, oh, yeah. um, seeing this ghost. Uh, so he didn't grow up in Lebanon during the war. He grew up in um, the States. Um, but his cousin from this village that we were actually, I think we weren't staying in that village at the time, but we stayed there later, uh, was killed in the war. And he had this vision of his cousin's ghost while he was on mushrooms as a kid. He was telling us the story and the story was interrupted by a call um, on the phone kind of indicating that there had been the first in this string of bombings that terrorized basically is the only word to describe it, um, Beirut for the next six months. And we're very clearly a campaign orchestrated at widening sectarian tensions and trying to destabilize the country. But nobody really knew who was doing it because in a country like Lebanon, there can be all these different actors that are benefiting. So some people were convinced it was Israel because they were trying to destabilize Hezbollah. Some people were um, thinking it was Hezbollah because they were trying to destabilize Israel. Some people thought it was Syria. Some people thought it was the US. Um, I mean, it was uh, a very conspiracy laden time, as it always is. I mean, when you have a string of nine bombings like that that are still unsolved. Yeah. Most political crimes like that are unsolved in Lebanon, though, like most of the political assassinations. Yeah. Let's, let's go to our them, next slide. Yeah, that, they're good example. So, um, since 1976, no political assassination has been sort of properly solved. And the Rafi Kareri assassination, the one that kind of shaped my time there, mm -hmm. um, they issued uh, arrest warrants. This UN tribunal was formed, um, a special, it's kind of the first time it ever happened, a special tribunal to investigate this because for obvious reasons, like everybody was like really afraid that investigating it internally would spark another civil war and um, the country would unravel. And so they kind of outsourced it. And the UN issued arrest warrants for Hezbollah members, but they vanished. Um, so that's kind of the closest anything has ever come to being solved. But most people, even still within the country, dispute that and have their own pet conspiracy theories about what really happened. 
Okay, well, to see more artwork, you're going to need to pick up a copy of Spring Rain. Um, and what, when was, what was the publication date on that? Uh, came out at the end of January of this year, so great time. <laughs> <laughs> but not much of a book tour, as you can imagine. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to call for a... Uh... For questions, we... If, if anyone's watching us on YouTube and has a question, you can ask it there. But um, I have a question that I thought, because there's a few times throughout the book, we kind of see these caged dogs that mm -hmm. are outside. Was it outside your apartment building? Or... Yeah. yeah. What was the story about that? I kind of, that was the one thing yeah. I was kind of looking for some resolution. I was like, did they die? Yeah. Did, they, did someone release them? Did you ever feed them? No, I never fed them. I mean, one thing about nonfiction, writing nonfiction, which is kind of my whole life, right? Like I, my books are either history books or memoirs. Um, when I work, do freelance work, I usually do as a journalist. Um, I teach comics nonfiction. The great thing about nonfiction is sometimes it just tells you stories that are just like, yeah. Um, so there was actually, you know, starving dogs locked up outside of my apartment. Um, and I wrote about them in my diaries constantly. And, um, you know, they're just, great image that I then went on to later mine. A strange thing about that time in my life, actually, um, that uh, was this, I had this kind of unshakable feeling that I was a character in something that I was writing later on. So I think I was really on the lookout for literary devices, maybe, in my, like, unravelment. Um, but I really latched onto these dogs. Um, and yeah, they're still there. There were still dogs when I went back in 2017 um, to that building to take reference photos. I'm sure it's the like children of the dogs from 2005. But. Well, it's funny what you mentioned about there sometimes just are things that don't don't resolve themselves in nonfiction. But I remember reading an interview with, and I apologize, I'm not going to remember the author's name, but he wrote the Wallander, Inspector Wallander uh, mm. mystery novels from uh, Sweden. And uh, he will often have things in his books that, you know, such and such happens and that never gets resolved. It's a side bit. It's something like that, that the inspector is not sure if it plays into the, the murder or whatever. But he, and he, the author was asked about this one time and he said, well, that's how life is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this stuff that just has no, you, you don't, you, you just don't end up learning what it was or what, how it plays into the greater uh, story, if you will, of what's going on. So you kind of captured that yeah. with the dogs. No, for sure. And I think in a greater way, like the story of that crisis, both politically and personally, yeah, um, it's true with that. Like neither of them really have re resolutions. Like I still struggle with these things, not at the critical level that is depicted in that book, but they're still part of my life. Um, and the Lebanese political scene is still totally bizarre and effed up. And, you know, there was, like I said, there was like a hundred days of protests in the streets um, just recently. Um, and it was really inspiring. And then the hammer of the virus fell. Um, so um, I think that it's always easy to look for convenient narratives. But um, I was sort of writing a book specifically about two narratives that don't have easily wrapped up endings. Mm. Uh, and so that was a challenge that I just leaned into and tried to talk about in the book. Uh, well, we're all sheltering in place or, or locked down, most of us at least, um, especially here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I know that this memoir had just been released earlier this year, but uh, is it is it mean of me to, to ask? Like, what are you working on now? <laughs> I mean, we got a yeah, lot. Yeah, no, I've got a new project. It's great. Um, I, it came in right under the wire before society collapsed. Mm -hmm. Um so my next project is a total uh, 180. Um, it's more similar to my first book, Brief Histories of Everyday Objects. Um, it's uh, YA nonfiction um, about uh, the relationship of humans and animals. Uh, it's called Commonplace Creatures, and it's sort of about domestication, about like commensalism, so like pests, rats, mice, cockroaches, stuff like that. Everything, any animal that's like super successful in raw numbers because they like hitched a ride to us and you know for like middle grade readers it was it's been super fun to research and write so i turned in the script to that to my editor um she's reading it right now um 
I'm like steaming away on it. Right now, I'm mainly watching my kids, obviously, because their school is out. Um, and uh, my wife's job just got a lot more intense. Um, well, I'm waiting to hear back from my editor. So I've got the twins. Um, but once society is rebuilt in whatever fashion it's rebuilt, I've got to do groundsman. <laughs> and hopefully it'll be a lot easier um, mental health wise to work on. But, mm. Well, so being I able to. Sorry. Uh, so being I think it will to... be. I mean, it's the one thing I learned about this last project actually was that the content of what you work on affects you. And so no. I made a real effort to choose the next project that would kind of make me really happy and excited. Puppies and kittens. Um, I mean, you've kind of got the, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I mean, back when you were first starting to think about, you know, I want comics art to be my, my career. I mean, you've kind of got the career I think you might have been dreaming of then. I mean, your, your first book becomes a bestseller. I mean, that, that does not happen to all of you budding writers out there. Your first book probably will not be a bestseller, even if it's a gem. Uh, what was that like? I mean, was that the moment you, were, you, you realized, okay, hey, this is, this is going to work out? Or did you know that yeah. beforehand? Yeah, I mean, kind of. Um, but also by that point, I was working, by that point, I was really doing it full time. Um, too, like uh, in the form of comics journalism for the NIB um, and a bunch of other places. So I kind of, um, my career took off in, uh, as a comics journalist and as an author, sort of um, simultaneously, um, but um, separately, I guess. Um, like there were different paths that had happened, but it happened at once. No, it's, it's great. Um, I am incredibly thankful um, and like recognize my shocking amount of privilege and achieving being able to do this all the time when I don't have to watch my kids, <laughs> um, which is it, which is most of the time. Like they're in preschool, this is my full-time job when society has not ended. Um, and that's amazing. Um, I think a big part of that is the nonfiction aspect. Like it's weirdly easier to get work specializing in that. Like that allows me to work as a journalist. It allows me to work as an essayist, as a memoirist. You know, there's all these different ways you can do nonfiction, whereas with fiction, it's kind of just doing the fiction, um, you know, with a book or whatever. There's other ways you can make a living, but um, the being able to get as much work as I have, I think has to do with that specialization. Um, which, I mean, as you recall, I was already even dancing around this at the Commonwealth Club. I remember making Spring Heel Jack while I was there. Do you remember that comic? It was this like little four page comic that I yeah. made. I think probably my first nonfiction work. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's always been something that's interested me. When I went to grad school for it, um, that was when I recognized that I was like not good at fiction and I was good at nonfiction. <laughs> and that was when I really specialized. And um, after that, uh, my career sort of came together. Well, thank you so much for Spring Rain. Uh, I, I'm truly going to cherish it, share it with as many people as possible. I think everyone should definitely have a copy. Um, whatever's going through, you know, your mind, your heart, your body, uh, especially during this this pandemic. I think we have we're out of time. I don't know if you you have some short parting words for our viewers during this chaos. Um, yeah, just like stay really safe and talk to people that you love a lot. Um, and also talk to people uh, like in lots of different places that you love because everybody's going through this. So if you have a friend that you grew up with who's like living in a totally different country, reach out to them and ask what's up because they're probably in lockdown too. And it might be interesting to like do a video call with them and catch up. I've done that a couple of times. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. Whatever is going to come out on the other side, it's going to be weird. <laughs> <laughs> Buckle up. Jesus. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for our special program. And, and thanks to the Commonwealth Club, like John said, uh, there are many ways in which you can support the work that we do. Head to commonwealthclub.org. Um, donate if you can. We have another program tomorrow, so check back or check all the listings. There's many programs that the club is doing at com commonwealthclub.org. John, anything else you want to add? Uh, commonwealthclub.org slash online you'll see our lineup we've got more than a dozen programs uh, already scheduled for online and more coming pretty much every day we'll see you next time thank you